Okay, so thank you everyone for joining us. We have um, today for the Australian Pituitary Foundation, we're very pleased to hold a online webinar, our first webinar for 2022. Uh, we are holding it today, uh, the day after Cushing's Awareness Day. Um, and we're very privileged to have a few speakers with us today, including um, Jack, who is one of our patients uh, with Cushing's disease. Uh, we have uh, Dylan uh, Senevratna Ipa, who is our pituitary endocrinologist. Uh, we have Cecilia Gazelle, who is our radiation oncologist treating um, Cushing syndrome. And I think for the first time in the Pituitary Foundation um, history, we're going to actually have a talk on uh, adrenalectomies as opposed to a transnasal pituitary surgery for our surgical aspect. And I thank um, James Lee for providing that talk for us a bit later on. A very slight background, uh, a lot of you will know that uh, Cushing's disease is a disease where the pituitary gland secretes too much ACTH, which leads to a whole myriad of uh, symptoms. The problem with Cushing's disease is that if left untreated, it can affect life expectancy over uh, by six to eight years. And Cushing's disease itself is rare with about 41 people diagnosed with Cushing's every year. Uh, the diagnosis that you, you will hear of with Cushing's disease is uh, quite uh, can be quite difficult and certainly treatment is not as black and white as just say take medication, just have medical surgery, just have radiation therapy. Okay. So this is what we'll hear about today. Uh, I will ask the audience and when we are speaking if you can turn your microphones off uh, for the talks. There will be opportunities for Q&A at the end. Uh, if you take your, your, your cameras can also be off uh, over the time of, this, of the actual presentations. Uh, the order of presentation today, firstly, will be Jack Forrest, who is our patient who talk us through his patient journey with Cushing's disease. Then we'll go through the medical aspects of, of um, Cushing's disease, the radiosurgical aspects in relation to treatment and a prognosis for Cushing's disease. And as I said, our last speaker is going to talk about the surgical aspects of Cushing's, but not so much from a pituitary perspective, but from the adrenal uh, gland perspective, which is the end organ that does secrete our cortisol, which is the issue that most of the patients with Cushing's um, deal with. Um, the webinar itself will be recorded. It will be recorded. It will be, uh, then it will be placed on our YouTube channel and we'll send out a um, blast when that does occur. If you do have questions to go uh, for uh, our panel, uh, there will be a QA and a specifically at the end, towards the end of this webinar at about 1.40. Happy for you to put the questions into the chat or you can email it directly to the chair.apf at gmail.com and that will be curated into the chats. Uh, our speakers will be on at that period of time to take all questions and comments with that. Okay. So without further ado, our first speaker, as I said, is Jack Forrest. Uh, he, or Jack Budasek, which is actually shown on the screen at the moment. Uh, he is our patient with Cushing's uh, and he's gone through a whole journey, which I think uh, demonstrates the rarity uh, the difficulty with diagnosis and treatment. And I'd like to invite Jack to speak to us. And I think Jack's gonna share his screen, uh, Kim, if you're able to allow that to occur. Thanks. How you going? Thanks, Ian. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep, no worries. I was gonna have a pre-recorded video, but um, I'm just gonna speak. I've had some technical difficulties this morning, but um, yeah, so I'm Jack. Hey everyone, thanks for coming today. And, and I really appreciate um, everyone involved in putting this together. I think the, um, the more awareness we can have for Cushing's, especially, um, the better it's going to help, obviously, the patient and the family and the support team, everyone involved. So thank you for that. Um, yeah, so my, my journey started probably around four years ago, just after I turned 21. And um, I, was, I was not really having many symptoms. It was mainly just... Uh, not being able to sleep and a bit of water retention around the ankles. Um, and that was pretty much it, had low testosterone. They were the three things really. So nothing was really screaming out um, Cushing's from that perspective. Um, so I was obviously having blood tests, you know, every month with my GP and everything was coming back normal because they were just doing, you know, full blood tests and um, not necessarily testing for cortisol or anything abnormally. Um, that way. So I was misdiagnosed for probably a few years, which is quite common to my knowledge, um, which looking back now, it made a lot of sense. But at the time, obviously, um, you know, you can't expect doctors to, to be specialised in, in everything. So 
yeah, there was a lot of misdiagnosis. Um, and it was finally when I was referred to an endocrinologist um, for some testosterone gel that uh, he thought he would do a brain scan to try and figure out what was causing the, the low testosterone. And it, that um, yeah, they found a, a lesion, like a tumor on the brain, on the pituitary gland, which is like the size of a pea. Um, and I just remember being told that at the time I was in Aubrey, which was about an hour from home and my, my family were interstate. Um, so I was on the phone to my mom and I just remember telling her and like, you know, it was, it sounds weird, but I was relieved at, at the same time to know that I wasn't going crazy, that there was potentially something actually, you know, going on. Cause obviously, um, I'd been told for the last few years that, um, there was nothing wrong with me. So I was relieved at the time. I didn't know it was Cushing's. All I knew was there was a, a growth, um, and then from there, there was a lot of testing involved um, down at St. Vincent's Hospital in trying to figure out if, if the tumour was actually causing the issue, which they found, obviously, with elevated cortisol in the urine, morning cortisol was elevated, um, and a number of other testing. Um, the final test, I guess, that, that put the pieces together was the, I forget what it's called, but I'll, I'll, you're laying on a table and they, they are putting catheters up up in the groin into the vein in the jugular here and they're taking blood samples um, from the pituitary gland and whilst they injected with different hormones and I guess that's got a very high success rate with, with giving you a, a positive, um, a, a, you know, being diagnosed, positive diagnosis of, of Cushing. So that was, I guess, when the penny dropped and, and you know, I was given the official diagnosis of, of Cushing's disease, um, which to be honest is, quite confronting you, you go home and you google and you have a, a bit of a research into what it does to the body and, and, and the long-term prognosis of it like Ian was talking about earlier and yeah it's not really what anyone wants to hear regardless of their age but um, I was very lucky that I had uh, you know I was young and I was fit and I was able to sort of you know take tackle it head on I didn't know I was going to be a journey like this I thought it would be over a bit a bit quicker than this but um yeah, from there, uh, I had a few options as to whether I had uh, surgery or radiation or, um, you know, had half the pituitary taken out or the adrenals taken out. And I, I guess I had a really good conversation with Carmela Caputo, who was my endocrinologist and still is today. Like she's uh, made my journey far easier than what it could have been. She's an amazing person. And um, if you do see this, Kamala, thank you. Um, I know you're on maternity leave, but I, do, I appreciate your ability to be there for me whenever I need you. So thank you. Um, so I guess the, the options were laid out to me on a table. And for me, the lowest risk with the highest potential for re, you know, reward being remission was surgery. So uh, when was it? It was June of 2020 when I had my first surgery. Um, and my levels did come down post-surgery, but not to, um, I guess, the levels that they were supposed to. They were more so of a normal level, whereas they should have dropped below that. And I guess a few weeks after that, I was feeling pretty good. And then testing, uh, say three months after that, it revealed that it, it had come back. Um, cortisol was elevated again. And yeah, I guess I was given another set of options in regards to do I do surgery again do I have radiation or do I yeah, have the pituitary gland taken out and, and the same decision was made to have another surgery so I did that in November so six months later that year and yeah same result unfortunately um, I remember sitting in the chair with my dad he was there at the time and being told that it, yeah, it looks, obviously we didn't know at the time, but it looks like it, it was not successful. Um, and that was definitely the hardest out of the entire journey, the hardest day of my life by far, um, just due to the fact that I felt like I had, you know, had exhausted my options in regards to trying to, you know, resolve my health issues. So that was tough, but I found the only way I was going to be able to move forward was I threw myself back into work. So I moved back on the farm, went full-time with work, studied, um, 
and shut myself off really for six months to try and just get myself in a good headspace again, which I did. And I think that personally made such a big difference. It really enabled me to, to um, look at it from a fresh perspective rather than why me what, as a victim, which is not going to get you anywhere. So six months on, I was sort of placed with two or three options, whether I have radiation or I have the adrenals taken out, which um, I just, yeah, I just had to pick the, the lesser of two evils for me personally, and that was radiation. Um, there was risks, obviously, I spoke to the radiologist, there's risks with everything, but for me, that was my decision. And now I'm coming up 12 months post radiation. Um, I can speak briefly on that. That was really quite a, uh, well, the experience was, as good as it could be. I walked in, had my mask done one day, and then a few months later, I went in to the, the Epworth at Richmond and the team there were amazing, um, so obliging and, and made sure that I was you know, not, not uncomfortable. So I was in and out sort of in 20 minutes, um, felt the same as, as I did when I walked in and um, not much had changed from that day until about a month ago when I started to get Hives, I started to sleep a bit better. Um, swelling had subdued a little bit. And, you know, so I had some testing done. And it looks like my levels have dropped dramatically over half. They're not into full remission as of yet, but um, they're, yeah, they're, they're of, of what I guess a normal person's levels should be. So uh, my endocrinologist thinks that it's sort of a relative deficiency since my body's been functioning at such high cortisol levels for so long. It's, um, yeah, since it's over half, my body's just reacting to that. So it's looking like hopefully over the next few months, whether it's six or 12 months, that some form of remission does take place. And, um, you know, hoping that the pituitary is able to fire on its own uh, rather than, you know, being on long-term steroids. But yeah, that's all ahead of me. I don't know what, what that's going to look like, but um, yeah, I, 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 as Ian has, has mentioned, I've gone through almost uh, the entire process. Hopefully that this, this is the last process for me and, and I, I'm able to um, move forward with, with my life. Um, but yeah, I, I think uh, I just wanted to mention a few things that really helped me along the way was obviously with Cushing's, a lot of people struggle with um, the, you know, the self-image issues that come with potentially the weight gain and things like that. And I found, you know, I'm now four kilos heavier than I started four years ago. And I think it's enabled me to, um, I guess, not hide it because I, I, I kind of was embarrassed at the time, but um, live somewhat of a normal life. And I think I was talking to my partner last night, Melissa, saying that, you know, keeping active and keeping, if you're able to keep working and, and living somewhat of a normal life is really going to put you in a good place if you ever do get into a remission um, position so that you can just go back to, you know, living your life before your Cushing's journey started. Um, that was, yeah, I'd say that was really important for me and making sure that you have a great, great support network. I'm very blessed that that my family and my friends were there for me, still are. And um, it's definitely made, made the process of, which is a really tough process. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna say here it's, that it's, it's not a long slog because it is, but um, having those people on your side really does help. Um, and yeah, I, I, I'm here, I'm, I'm 25 and hopefully, you know, I can say I'm in remission over the next six to 12 months. And, um, yeah, I live an amazing life and, and Cushing's hasn't, you know, haven't let that change it. So, um, yeah, if anyone's got any questions after, I will be here for the Q&A and, and, yeah, thanks for your time. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Jack, for your really quite personal discussion of your journey and your talk. Um, the, I think that what I get out of this is someone who has uh, gone through the whole journey that we talk about. And there are patients with Cushing's who are lucky, I guess, in a way, who have one treatment, one surgery, and they're in remission. But Cushing's, as part of the pituitary tumour 
uh, the bundle that we have, Cushing is the one condition whereby it would seem a, a vast amount of patients will go through a long diagnosis and multiple treatment options. Uh, I will put my hand up and say that I was I operated on Jack twice, and I did not get uh, we did not get remission with Jack's surgery. We talk about uh, remission with surgery itself being about you know 60 70 percent of remission rates uh, in in most circumstances, and certainly we did not get remission with Jack, which was disappointing both for Jack and me. And I just um, and what hits me as a as an, I guess as a neurosurgeon, as a doctor, is that the disappointment and how it can really affect people's mental state as well when you actually, you know, when you put your uh, hope in the fact that the actual treatment is going to help you and you come back twice and it didn't. And just, I guess I'm quite amazed at the way that you, Jack, can actually just move on and say, okay, throw yourself in the work, get on to the next thing and how to go, things like that. Um, one point I do take is that you said that when you look at the next options of radio surgery versus taking out half the gland or taking out the adrenal glands you went for the easier or the lesser option as you say i'd be interested to see our speakers later about what they feel about that in terms of radio surgery versus adrenalectomies it might be quite interesting to see their thought process on that um, i will repeat again if anyone has any questions uh, you can put them in the chat and we can actually uh, address them at the q a towards the end uh, but otherwise, if there's no comments now, uh, I will move on to our next speaker okay, who has just dropped off. I can, oh, there he is. Uh, so the, um, the, if I may move on to Dylan, if Dylan, if you can um, unmute yourself and pop your camera on. Uh, Dylan is a pituitary endocrinologist uh, who works in Victoria, in Melbourne. Uh, he has a special interest in this and area and certainly I'm very privileged to work at times with with Dylan in these situations here. So Dylan's going to talk about the medical aspects of pushing disease. So I'd like to invite Dylan to keep talking. Thanks. Ian, I've got some slides. Um, you, can I share that? Is that all right? Uh, yes, thank you. Yeah, okay. All right. Can you see that all right? Yes. And you can hear me loud and clear? Indeed. Okay. All right, so I think, uh, uh, thanks a lot, Jack, for um, sharing all your experiences. And uh, I might try and put some context of your journey into my talk that now that I've heard you speak as well. Um, I'll, I'll focus, obviously, on um, the typical presentation of Cushing's and your your uh, your presentation is as you as you described as well is certainly not not typical and uh, um, and then of course I'll spend quite a lot of time uh, just uh, trying to make everyone understand as to why this is so difficult to diagnose in terms of a condition and then of course I'll touch broadly on on the different modalities uh, and and medical therapy being one but uh, I'm sure the speakers. Uh, uh, that are to follow will also touch more on on so, some of these aspects. Um, so I think it's probably important to first understand uh, how cortisol is being produced in the body. Uh, this is just a very uh, simple diagram showing that, and uh, I'm not sure whether you can see my uh, cursor here, but cortisol gets produced from the adrenal glands, um, two glands that sit on top of the kidneys, um, and the, the, the production of cortisol gets a signal from the brain. Um, it starts off at the uh, hypothalamus, which is a part of the brain that produces a hormone called CRH. CRH signals to the, um, AC, uh, the pituitary gland, which also is in the brain uh, at the base of the skull, and that produces ACTH. Now, ACTH then signals downward to the adrenal gland for the production of cortisol, and this is the so-called hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis of hormone production. And, and there are different factors that will uh, regulate this. Now, in terms of Cushing's, uh, Cushing's uh, syndrome and, and then its causes, uh, it's broadly divided into what we would call STH dependent Cushing's and STH independent Cushing's. And that really depends on where, that, uh, where the problem is 
uh, originating from that causes Cushing's or the excess cortisol production. Now, uh, a vast majority of cases tend to be ACTH dependent Cushing's and of them uh, pituitary tumors uh, or pituitary causes tend to be the majority of those ACTH dependent uh, cases of Cushing's. Um, so what that means is there's something in the, pituit the pituitary gland itself, often a tumor, that will then produce uh, an excess amount of uh, ACTH, then, then signals downstream for excess production of cortisol, which comes from the adrenal gland, but the problem originates in the pituitary. There are ectopic sources, and what's meant by that is that there can be other areas of the body that produce ACTH in excess, but certainly not the common uh, source of ACTH. In ACTH independent Cushing's, essentially, there are adrenal nodules uh, either on one or both adrenal glands, which will cause the excess cortisol production from the adrenal gland itself. And there isn't a, a pituitary or higher problem. Now, this diagram shows you how um, cortisol is produced in the body, and understanding this does uh, help uh, understand why perhaps this is such a difficult condition to diagnose in in the in, in a said individual there's uh, the cortisol production can vary quite a lot um, depending on which time of the day you're looking at um, we certainly have tend to have higher amounts of cortisol in the morning preparing us for the day waking us up and then as the day progresses the cortisol levels tend to drop off um, these cortisol levels hence vary uh, even in a given individual uh, depending on what time of day you're looking at and uh, also in between individuals as well, and, and providing reference ranges for, each, uh, for, for how you measure cortisol, particularly in the blood, can be difficult. Um, so this is the normal rhythm of cortisol production, and this diurnal rhythm of cortisol production uh, is, is lost in Cushing's, where there's a pathological excess of cortisol. Now, this uh, diagram uh, certainly shows some of the typical, more typical features of Cushing's, and you, as you did, Jack, and if you Google Cushing, you'll see a certain person, a, a person that looks like they're Cushinoid. Um, and these are some of the typical features um, in the face. You can have acne, uh, red looking cheeks with uh, puffy looking face with thinning of hair. In the body, you get excess uh, body hair growth, a lot of weight gain, particularly centrally in the abdomen, uh, giving rise to a pendulous abdomen. And, and there can be purple, particularly purple stretch marks um, with easy bruising and thinning of the skin and, and, and uh, thinning of the muscles and atrophy of the muscles causing muscle weakness, but there could be fat pads as well, um, particularly along the back. So apart from these external features, there's a lot of, uh, and this is why we worry about this, uh, the increased morbidity and mortality of Cushing's comes from uh, the obesity, the diabetes, the high blood pressure, the, the osteoporosis that it can cause. But if you, if you looked at... Uh, discriminatory features or features which are specific to Cushing's, you'll see the thinning of the skin, the spontaneous bruising, the muscle weakness, these purple striae, they're the more specific features. Um, but of course, you know, uh, the, the other metabolic conditions, as you can imagine, are very common in the population as well. Now, this slide shows how we would initially screen for Cushing's um, and, and screening tests for Cushing's have uh, sort of evolved into this because uh, of how difficult it is to just do a, a single blood test and just say someone's got high cortisol. And we tend to try and measure it in different, how cortisol appears in different body bodily secretions. Uh, and so we use urine, um, saliva and blood to try and get a sense of whether someone's got cortisol excess. Um, and so if you we were doing a, a, a urine test, we'll collect it over 24 hours. Uh, and, and see what the cortisol is. Similarly, you know, you can try and measure salivary cortisol uh, to look for that lack of diurnal rhythm where uh, at late nights you expect low cortisol, but if your cortisol levels are raised, then you try and get a sense that it, it may be pathologically up. Uh, if you're measuring it in blood, then we, apart from just doing cortisol levels themselves, uh, a one milligram of dexamethasone could be taken and then a blood sample followed by that to see if the levels remain high. So we try and screen in a few different ways and we do repeat these tests on multiple occasions, uh, but, but, uh, but particularly because these levels can vary. And, and there's certainly about 
um, twenty percent false positives that we can get by by screening in that way. So you do have to have what we call a clinical suspicion to go along with some of these screening tests. Now. That screening is done because those tests, as cumbersome as they may seem, are still probably simpler than going on to uh, more uh, further testing. Uh, and, and we do have tests, then people will, the patients will proceed to confirm their diagnosis of Cushing's. And on screen are a few different tests that uh, may be utilized depending on which center you end up presenting to. In, in Melbourne at St. Vincent's Eye Center, uh, certainly use, utilizes the third test, the uh, intravenous uh, dexamethasone suppression test uh, as our test of choice. Um, and, and, and this is, we, we, we screen and then we do this to confirm because this test involves uh, a lot more blood sampling um, and, in, and intravenous infusion of dexamethasone and, and testing over a couple of days. And, and the other tests listed there are, are similar where you need multiple blood samples uh, collected. And what's common to these is that dexamethasone or some form of uh, external steroid is administered to try and see if these levels can be suppressed or not with different sort of cutoffs suggesting pushing. Uh, this is a busy slide and I'm not gonna go through all what you see here, but essentially once you confirm someone to have Cushing syndrome confirmed biochemically, then we try and work out, as I showed you with the causes initially, is this ACTH dependent or not? And where along that pathway that I showed you earlier is the problem. And that's why you then need to go on to do an ACTH level. And, and depending on what the ACTH level comes back as, you know, what part of that flow chart you see, uh, which is a quite oversimplified version of what we end up doing, but um, that, that flow chart and which path you go down will be dependent on whether you come back with um, what your ACTH level comes back at. Now, as I said, the commonest cause is pituitary Cushing's, ACTH dependent pituitary Cushing's. And, and so therefore, if the ACTH levels are high enough, then we end up uh, going with imaging of the pituitary gland. And of course, in the more straightforward cases, a clearly identified tumor will be, will be seen on, on, a, on a scan. And if it's big enough, it'll be attributed as the source of the problem. And often people will proceed to have uh, surgery without too much other testing. And that's a, a more straightforward case, um, but certainly it, it isn't always that straightforward and, and more testing uh, for the, this time now to try and identify the exact source of the Cushing's is necessary. Um, and Jack, as Jack mentioned, one of, the, one of the commonest tests that we end up doing uh, in addition to imaging, it is further uh, sampling of, of, the, of the, uh, the blood supply of the pituitary, which is called the um, bilateral inferior petrous or sinus sampling or IPSS to try and see if the, the actual uh, excess of ACTH and cortisol are, are central and coming from the pituitary gland. Um, there's a few other tests mentioned there, CIH test, high dose uh, dexamethasone suppression test, all these help towards identifying the source uh, or cause of Cushing's. Now, um, this slide just shows sort of the over, sort of overall um, treatment options that we've got um, and, and particularly um, keeping pituitary Cushing's, uh, pituitary ACTH dependent Cushing's in mind. Um, and, and at the top, as you can see, transphenoidal surgery offers the best sort of chance of going into remission and a cure, um, and hence often um, offered as first line and even um, uh, as in Jack's case, will be offered repeatedly. Um, uh, I will touch on some of the other uh, aspects as I go along, but medical therapy, uh, pituitary irradiation and bilateral adrenalectomies are the other options. So what is remission or also known as cure. And, and I think the better term to use is remission um, because of the amount of follow-up that this condition needs, even if it looks like it's gone away after surgery. And the high rates, uh, as we've already heard, uh, that it can come back at. So what we end up doing after surgery is we postoperatively monitor these morning cortisol levels um, to see if they're dropping, as that Jack described, which didn't happen or did happen initially, but recurred. Um, uh, some of those screening tests, including the urine test that we used initially, 
to, uh, we will use again to see if uh, the cortisol levels are, are dropping. Um, of course, from, from a symptomatic perspective, uh, whilst excess cortisol in itself can cause symptoms, uh, patients may feel worse initially pre, uh, than they did preoperatively. Um, often a good sign, um, although it's hard to convince people that they're getting better, uh, but uh, that's because the uh, relative cortisol deficiency that could be occurring that causes a different set of problems. And we do find ourselves having to give hydrocortisone back um, after surgery, especially if uh, patients look like they're uh, going into remission, and, and that would depend on some of their levels. Now, in terms of someone who's gone into remission, they still need very close follow-up um, every few months initially, uh, we're monitoring for the pre-dose cortisol levels. Um, if they have ended up on hydrocortisone because their levels were uh, quite low straight after surgery, um, we will monitor to see if their body kicks in, the rest of their pituitary gland can kick in and produce cortisol again, um, because the normal pituitary would have gone to sleep if there was an area, a discrete area that was producing a lot. So when you take the tumor out, normal pituitary will not work to, uh, normally, but then if they are on hydrocortisone, you'll see that sometimes they can then be weaned off and that would be months to years before they are weaned off it. And this is for someone who's gone into remission. Now, we've discussed this. Um, recurrence uh, is what we always monitor for, even if you're in remission. And it will depend on individual centers and surgeons as to how um, uh, likely they are to recur. But broadly speaking, across the literature, there's, there's about a 25% chance of a recurrence um, on, uh, on a five-year follow-up. And if you haven't ever gone into remission, um, as in Jack's case, um, and the cortisol remains high after surgery, um, then, of course, the, the, the discussions of those various modalities that I've listed are necessary. And that's when a, a, a repeat discussion about transphenoidal exploration um, to, to, uh, needs to be had. Um, sometimes there are areas left behind that cannot be uh, safely approached surgically. Um, we talked about the concept of um, taking half, half the pituitary out. Um, so these are, these are the uh, options surgically. Of course, we're going to hear more about radiation. Um, and I've just put some broad sort of um, chances of remission with those uh, uh, there. But uh, chance of about 60 to 80% um, uh, remission rate, depending uh, uh, on, on radiotherapy. And the problem is that you, you are left with a chance of and about a one third chance of uh, losing other hormonal axes, pituitary function, what's called hypopituitarism. Medical management is used in different settings and I'll touch on that shortly. Um, and we'll hear more about um, adrenalectomy as well, um, which is very much in Cushing's still last resort. So medical management, uh, this is just uh, um, a slide showing the different uh, scenarios that we could end up using um, medical management in. It, it could, of course, be used as primary therapy. Um, not often, but uh, if for some reason we feel that, that a patient is not suitable for surgery or you know, there, there's an uh, unwillingness for surgery, well, then uh, it could be considered primary therapy. Uh, it's often second-line therapy in place of something like repeat surgery or radiotherapy. Um, and it, it, it also can be used uh, as an adjuvant or add-on uh, uh, whilst awaiting the effects of radiotherapy as well. Uh, we do use it preoperatively um, whilst awaiting transphenoidal surgery as well, um, especially we, we've had to do that with, with COVID as well um, in a few instances, uh, if surgery is being delayed um, or, or there's a high-risk uh, patient. Listed on screen are different uh, medications that can be used. Um, and again, two levels are targeted with these uh, different medications. Uh, essentially, there are the ones that act on at the adrenal level and uh, reduce the cortisol production at the adrenal level. What we, um, uh, and, and the commonest drugs that we find ourselves using are either metarapone or ketoconazole. Um, and uh, these can normalize the urinary cortisols in about half of people. Um, and the other drugs that we 
uh, end up uh, trying to go for are uh, the drugs that work at the pituitary level. Uh, Cabergoline and pasiriotide are two common ones that we end up using and uh, get 20 to 40% of uh, normalizing of free cortisol with that. So uh, in summary, I think I've managed to cover that diagnosing pushings is certainly something that can be uh, uh, requiring multiple tests looking at multiple different things initially to try and screen for and confirm the actual presence of Cushing's biochemically, uh, having had a clinical suspicion. And then there's multiple, uh, both biochemical testing and imaging that may be necessary to try and confirm the actual source or cause of Cushing's. Um, Cushing's uh, disease, which of the pituitary, the ACTH dependent form of Cushing's that comes from the pituitary uh, should be initially managed surgically uh, to allow the best chance of remission. Um, and uh, uh, unfortunately, there's still a reasonably high rate of recurrence, about a quarter of people recurring. There is definitely no ideal medical therapy and success in medical therapy is not nearly as successful uh, than uh, with, compared to some of the other modalities. Uh, metaropone and ketoconazole work at the adrenal level inhibiting the adrenal production of cortisol and cabergoline and pasiriotide uh, uh, work at the pituitary level to inhibit the signaling. Um, a majority of patients uh, can achieve some form of disease control, but will end up multi needing multimodality therapy, uh, initially surgery, maybe an add-on of radiotherapy uh, and, and some medical therapy whilst uh, the rest of the therapy works. Um, as a final resort, bilateral adrenalectomy where the cortisol production eventually comes from uh, can be considered if, if none of the other options have uh, seemed to or seem to work. I think I'll be happy to take questions probably at the end along with the, the rest of the speakers. Okay, thank you very much, Dylan, for that really quite comprehensive uh, review of Cushing's. Uh, I think everyone can see it's quite a complex area and um, what I get out of your talk is that the diagnosis can be, can take a while. You mentioned that the diagnostic screening test that we do at the end, you said in part it depends on which hospital, which kind of shows that there's not one test that is superior that will give you 100% sensitivity in getting a diagnosis, uh, which adds to the difficulty of um, diagnosing uh, Cushing's. And then, as you said, the treatment that, you know, medically, and you've over given an overview of um, transnasal surgery, radio surgery, even adrenalectomy, even with that, uh, treatment may not be 100% successful, which is the difficulty with Cushing's. Um, as Dylan said, he'll be around for the Q&A a bit later on. I've got a few questions for you later, Dylan. Um, but there's also uh, the facility in the chat uh, for people to put questions in so that we can actually then go through them at the end. Um, uh, I'd like to invite our next speaker now, uh, who is Dr. Cecilia uh, Zell from uh, New South Wales. Uh, she is a radiation oncologist, uh, has a special interest in neuro-oncology and gamma knife. Uh, she has come highly recommended uh, with a lot of great experience in skull-based radio surgery and treatment for this. Uh, Cecilia, you may or may not be aware that our patient, Jack, who spoke earlier, has had radio surgery uh, down here, I think with Genesis Healthcare down here. Uh, actually, it may, may not be Genesis, I said the wrong thing, but uh, with, with Neda's group here. Uh, and at 11 months, he's had uh, a cortisol now, which has halved in um, levels, which is quite pleasing from his perspective. And he's, uh, and certainly he thought that radio surgery from his perspective was actually quite a, uh, a, a quite a good experience, I guess. So I'd like to be interested to hear your thoughts on that and you can know, have a ch chat out radio surgery for pushing to these. Thanks, Cecilia. Thanks, Ian. And uh, thank you to the Foundation for inviting me to talk today. So like Ian mentioned, I'm going to talk on radiosurgery for Cushing's disease. And just a quick overview of the things that I'll be discussing today. So firstly, evolution of different radiotherapy techniques. What is radiosurgery? Uh, the different modalities that we use to deliver radiosurgery. Our expectations of success in Cushing's disease. A couple of case examples and briefly on some toxicities. So evolution of radiotherapy. Uh, Cecilia, you might have to play your slide screen. Oh, can, can you see. not see them from your end? I can see I can see the PowerPoint, but not the actual presentation. Oh, okay. I, I, so I did you... click on that a couple of times. Let me just try that again. I'm sorry. 
say the bottom get out. Can you see it now on your end? Um, it's coming. Just let me know when you can. Can anyone else see the actual presentation slides as yet as a slideshow? Yeah, not yet. Um, I'm still seeing the PowerPoint as well. Let me just yes. try if I stop sharing it again and then I'll try sharing it again. So I've just tried stopping and starting. How are we going? Yeah, so same. We still just got the overview of the uh, PowerPoint. Okay. And is it, is it is it running the screen on yours? It is. Yeah. So let me try and get rid of it again for a sec, and we'll see if I can get it out. about now yeah perfect okay great <laughs> so what it wanted me to do is actually put the full powerpoint slides up on mine without them anyway it doesn't matter it's all good uh so where are we up to now the problem is it's not moving along what which slide can you see on your screen at the moment uh, the title slide still radiation surgery for yeah, unfortunately, now it's not actually letting me advance the slides. Ah, good. Okay. Ah, there you go. That was Perfect. Good. Excellent. So sorry for that delay. So this was just quickly the overview that I mentioned, and we'll start with evolution of radiotherapy. So these are the modern techniques of radiotherapy. And in fact, um, 3D conformal radiotherapy uh, is what was the standard treatment uh, when I was a young trainee back in the early 2000s and late 90s. Uh, and this involved static radiotherapy beams with some field shaping involving multi-leaf collimation or MLCs. And I'll show you a picture of that in a moment. But there was lots of normal tissue dose. Now, Ian, I don't know if you can help. Someone's got their microphone on and there's a lot of... Um, You're yeah, right. Uh, now, let me try to help. Um, yes, you're right. Can I you mute can whoever's who got is. their microphone on? Can you milk, mute him at all? Um, I actually okay. know who that is too. I can see which one it is. Okay, yeah. perfect. Great, thank that, you. That should be, thank you. Much better, I'll keep going. So, um, and then in the sort of the mid 2000s, we moved to IMRT or intensity modulated radiation therapy. And then in the sort of 2010s era, we've moved on to VMAT, which is volumetric modulated arc therapy. And both IMRT and VMAT involve dynamic shaping of multiple beams or arcs which enabled for far better dose conformality and much less normal tissue dose. And I'll show you a picture in a moment. But this is actually just a picture of the MLCs and these are lead leaves. Uh, and you can see they're in a shape which would have been you know, the shape of the target. And back in 3D conformal, these leaves were fixed in those positions and the beam passed through that. And so the bit that was blocked was blocked and the beam passed through the open area. But when we moved on to IMRT and then VMAT, those leaves were moving constantly as the beam of radiation is being delivered. And that was what enabled much tighter uh, dose conformality and also a steeper drop off of dose beyond the target. And this just gives you an example of that. So this is an IMRT plan. You can see both on the left, the 3D conformal plan and on the right, the IMRT plan. And so what I've got there is I've got a red line, which is the target. And the red shading is the target dose. And you can see with 3D conformal, even with that kind of shaping with the MLCs, it's still a bit boxy. 
And what's really obvious is that green shaded area is actually about two thirds of the dose and that's all going to normal brain tissue on the other side of the target. Whereas with IMRT, the, the red shading is pretty tight to the actual target. And that two third dose is also quite tight to the target. So we're not seeing lots of normal tissue dose. Well, what about radius surgery? So stereotactic radius surgery uh, requires additional fixation. So that's a mask with extra support or a head frame. And I'll show you a couple of pictures in a moment. It also requires real time image guidance uh, so we can be more accurate. So what we want with radius surgery is to be accurate to less than one millimeter compared with about three millimeters for sort of standard brain uh, work other than radiosurgery. surgery. It also requires additional quality assurance. So there's extra physics testing required to ensure that we're doing that precise delivery with the really steep dose gradient. And this is a picture of the different um, fixation devices. So on the left, we've got a fixed head frame. And so we use that for gamma knife surgery. On, in the middle photo, that's actually a standard mask. So that's more used for standard brain treatments for other types of tumors rather than what we'd be doing for pituitary work. And on the right is a relocatable mask that we would use for stereotactic radiosurgery. And that mask has a mask actually across the front, but also across the back of the head, it has extra support across the chin and forehead, and that enables it to be much more precise uh, rather than that middle one. So the uh, head frame for gamma knife surgery is actually precise down to 0 0.5 of millimeter. And the SRS mask is precise to about 0 0.7. So they're quite close. Uh, but certainly much uh, more accurate than the standard masks that we use for other treatments. So stereotactic radius surgery is defined as one to five treatments, and it's a large dose of radiation in each of those treatments. Whereas stereotactic radiotherapy is generally a low dose per treatment, but you're often giving it every day up to six or more treatments. And it's also known as fractionated stereotactic radiotherapy or FSRT. So what are the different modalities that we might use to deliver this treatment? So the first is the linear accelerator or LINAC. And this is an X-ray generating machine. It's actually the workhorse of what we do almost all our radiotherapy on. It delivers very high energy X-rays or electrons to a target, but it can be adapted for stereotactic radiosurgery or stereotactic radiotherapy, requiring a bit of additional equipment and extra commissioning. And uh, it also requires high quality real-time image guidance for verification. And this is actually a picture of a LINAC um, set up for stereotactic radiosurgery. So hopefully my pointer will work or it may not. Now, unfortunately my pointer is not gonna work, but um, what you can see on the left picture is, is the full machine. So the big sort of round area with the arm is what we call the head and the gantry. Um, and then you've got the bed and you can see a green mask locked in on the bed there. And over that is what we call a fiducial box. So that's helping us get the patient set up very accurately. And then there are a couple of screens in the picture and that's for the real time image guidance again. So we get the patient set up and then we do some imaging with low dose uh, cone beam CT usually. Uh, also orthogonal x-rays, so just standard x-rays, but done in different positions to make sure we've got the patient in the correct position before we actually deliver uh, the treatment. Now this is uh, for a LINAC. These are a picture of the what we call cones. So you can see lots of tiny different apertures there from five millimeters all the way up to about 25 millimeters. And these would be attached to the head of the machine and the beam of radiation will pass through those tiny apertures, meaning that only what's open is going to be delivered. And so we do use that for stereotactic radiosurgery. Uh, sometimes we also use those MLCs, the picture that I showed you before. So that might be those larger MLCs or we might use what's called mini MLCs. And that depends on the type of machine that's being used. Uh, but that just shows you a bit more of the equipment and you might have heard the word cones at some point. The other option is gamma knife surgery. So a bit different, instead of having um, a machine that generates high energy x-rays, sorry, we've got a machine that houses 192 very, very tiny radioactive sources. So these are cobalt sources and they're delivering gamma rays. 
And this is a dedicated machine that just does stereotactic radiosurgery for brain treatments. Uh, and in fact, this, the specifics down the bottom are probably not particularly helpful for you, but the collimator sizes are after you've just seen those pictures of the cones that we would use on a linear accelerator. Instead of having lots of different options, we only have three, but uh, we only need the three, four, eight and 16 millimetres in order to manipulate them into delivering what we want for the individual patient. And this is what um, the gamma knife unit that I work at looks like. So that's the bed in the first picture on the left and the machine is, has all the covers on it. There's a little uh, semicircular cradle there where the head frame attaches into it. And the picture on the right shows your patient as we're getting them linked up into that cradle ready for treatment. Now the picture down the bottom shows what's actually happening behind all those covers. So up the top is where all the little uh, cobalt sources are actually housed. So they're housed up in lead shielding. And then we're able to manipulate them down if, into those different dwell positions as required in order to deliver a treatment for the patient. And so what about our expectations for Cushing's disease? So the role of stereotactic radiosurgery or stereotactic radiotherapy is usually a second line treatment as Dylan mentioned before. So it's often for inoperable recurrence or to treat the cellar when the biochemical remission hasn't been achieved post-surgery. After we give radiation, biochemical remission can be achieved at up to 80% of patients. Um, and usually that is maintained, but it can take up to three years to achieve that with a range of around about 12 months to 36 months. Now, specifically for Cushing's, uh, it is preferable to give a large single fraction, so stereotactic radiosurgery. And if we're able to do that, usually the biochemical remission is achieved more quickly. Uh, it's certainly preferable for what we call functional tumours. So things like Cushing's disease or prolactin secreting tumours, they do tend to require the bigger dose of radiation. Uh, and we find that that's definitely going to achieve a better outcome. But actually radiation is very effective at stopping the tumour from growing. It's the biochemistry that takes a little bit longer. So what about uh, stopping the somatostatin analogue? So this is a little bit more controversial. And in fact, the data on this is somewhat conflicting, but there is the question of whether if a patient's on the medical therapy, it might reduce the efficacy of stereotactic radiosurgery. So usually there's a discussion between the radiation oncologist and the endocrinologist. And if it's possible, we would try to withdraw the treatment two months before the radiation was delivered. And I briefly just want to show you some case examples. So the first one is a 45 year old lady. Now she had salvage hypophysectomy three years um, prior to coming to see me and her original transfernoidal surgery was four years previously. She'd had eight months of um, after the surgery, she'd had weight gain, she became quite Cushingoid. She'd had a trial of Dostonex, but had ongoing elevated cortisol levels. And she came to me and I gave her linac based SRS to the cellar. Uh, so this just gives you a couple of pictures of her radiotherapy plan. So the pink shaded area is the target. So that's the entire cellar or pituitary fossa. The little yellow shaded area is the optic chiasm. Um, the green shaded area is the, the brainstem and you've got the globes or the eyes at the front. Now we've got a couple of lines there showing you the doses of radiation. And probably the most useful is the light green color, which is showing you the target dose covering that cellar quite nicely. Um, and the dark blue line, which is uh, well less than half the dose is still clear of the optic chiasm. And in fact, that's a, a dose that is tolerable by the optic apparatus. So we've been able to deliver the target dose to the target whilst preserving the vision, because obviously that's a very important aspect of delivering the treatment safely. And that particular patient, she actually achieved biochemical remission by two years. Uh, at that point, she'd lost more than 20 kilograms of weight. She had resolution of all her Cushing symptoms. And uh, at her last follow-up, which was four years after her radiotherapy, uh, the remission was maintained. However, she'd started to require a small amount of cortisol replacement at that point in time. And moving on to the second case, um, this patient had her original uh, surgery about five years prior to uh, presenting to me. 
she'd never really achieved biochemical remission and she had been on Dostonex and had now developed a recurrent nodule. And I gave her gamma knife uh, to that. And actually hers was quite interesting because when I first met her, I wasn't sure if we'd be able to deliver it as the single fraction given the uh, proximity to the optic chiasm. But the only way I thought we'd be able to achieve that would be with gamma knife rather than the LINAC just because of differences between the two modalities. But in fact, it was a, a beautiful plan. And you can see there on the left, the yellow is the target dose and you can see the mass inside that. And the green is a, a low, much lower dose. And the yellow is, is sort of dipping under and coming back up. So we're sort of sparing the optic chiasm and the green dose, which is tolerable by the optic apparatus is going through part of the chiasm. But again, it's a tolerable dose. So it's an acceptable um, outcome. If this was done on a linear accelerator, there's no way she would have been able to have a single fraction. We would have had to give her the standard sort of six weeks of treatment, uh, which definitely has a lower success rate. And obviously also there's the inconvenience of having to come in every day for six weeks. So uh, with gamma knife surgery, we were able to keep the dose of the chiasm below the standard limits. I don't have any outcome data because of this was only uh, a month or so ago, but uh, it was a really nice plan. So I wanted to show it from that perspective. So lastly, just wanted to cover toxicities briefly. Uh, so generally it's very well tolerated, especially if we're talking about a single fraction of treatment. The risks are low. So risk of damage to the vision should be less than 1%. So if you're meeting those standard targets of what we want the dose to be below for the optic apparatus, the, the risk is well less than 1%. There is still a small risk of stroke longer term. The big uh, carotid arteries are right next to where we're treating. So that's a 1% risk and that's a long-term risk. Uh, there's an uh, inflammatory reaction that can happen after radiation in about 3%. Most of the time patients have no symptoms. We see it on a scan and it goes away of its own. And as Dylan mentioned before, risk of other hormonal functions of pituitary not working. I'd usually quote 30 to 50% uh, by 10 years. Um, but we always have to remember that that's multifactorial. The surgeons can't get away with everything. The surgery also carries a risk of causing damage to pituitary function. So it's a combination of all the treatments involved. Uh, and luckily we're, we're in an era now where pretty much every one of those hormones can be replaced by the endocrinologist. So uh, at least we have that, uh, even though it is a fairly common risk. I think that was the last slide, so thank you. Okay, perfect. Thanks so much, Cecilia, for going through that really quite detailed talk showing where we've come from and where we are going to. Um, I do like uh, how we now ha do have a radio surgery to give good options for patients. And I guess as a neurosurgeon, more and more we're seeing that you know, the term radiotherapy, nowadays there is a lot of radiosurgery because we do actually now means that we don't need to do microsurgery or neurosurgery. And for skull-based lesions like the pituitary gland, it is just as safe. You can see that uh, Cecilia said the risk to the optic apparatus of vision is less than 1%. When we do surgery, a lot of times the risk of, uh, to the vision is about 1%. Also, the risk to the pituitary gland over 30% 30, 30 over 10 years, risk of getting um, hypopituitarism, which is a uh, lack of hormonal use. But when we operate, there's an immediate sort of 6 to 8% risk of that can happen. So if the, the risk factors are, are equivalent, um, I think I, probably, I might ask Jack this earlier what, afterwards. Um, what is the patient's perspective in terms of having radiosurgery versus microsurgery? Uh, because you know, the patient may actually prefer light coming in for one or one to five fractions where they lie there for a few minutes rather than having a full anesthetic and actually having brain neurosurgery. So great insights there, Cecilia. So thank you for that. Um, our last speaker today, we often, we do like to have with our pituitary foundation webinars, we like to have a patient uh, medical radiotherapy and surgery. Traditionally, we talk about a neurosurgeon and transnasal surgery, but today we've got James Lee, who's the associate professor at uh, Monash and the Alfred Hospital, who is quite an academic uh, uh, surgeon. He's an endocrine surgeon and going to talk to us about bilateral adrenalectomies for Cushing's disease. Uh, so thanks very much for your time, uh, James. Thank you for that introduction, Ian. Can you hear me and see my slides? Um, okay. So I would like to um, thank the foundation and Ian for inviting me to this talk and thank you all for your time for coming uh, to the seminar today. 
So I'm going to talk about bilateral adrenalectomy, and as we've heard multiple times today, that is the last resort for patients uh, with Cushing's disease. So I just want to start by asking this question, who was Cushing? Cushing was um, the father of neurosurgery who worked at Johns Hopkins Hospital in the 1930s. He first described, uh, uh, this is uh, a picture of his index patient with Cushing's syndrome, and you can see the photo of this patient has been reproduced into those cartoons that you saw in the previous uh, presentations. So because he was the first surgeon who, who was exclusively a neurosurgeon, he wasn't rummaging around anywhere else in the body. So he, was, he, he thought all Cushing's um, patients were associated with a tumor in the pituitary gland. And we will later learn that that is not the case. So around that same time in a different institution in the US uh, at the Mayo Clinic, a couple of surgeons first published a series of patients who underwent adrenal surgery for Cushing's syndrome. So out of the 10 cases of patients that they presented, nine of them uh, underwent adrenal surgery, bilateral adrenal surgery in some of them. And I want you to focus on this little point here, 30%. So three out of those nine patients died after surgery, either from complications of the surgery or uh, adrenal insufficiency because both adrenal glands were removed. And at that time, uh, we did not have a way to replace the hormones um, that the adrenal glands produced. But don't worry, that's not the case these days anymore. So this is where we started. So the mortality from adrenal surgery significantly improved over the subsequent 10 years, especially after um, the discovery and the isolation of cortisol, uh, the main hormone uh, um, um, responsible for Cushing's disease, but uh, Cushing syndrome, uh, but also the main one of the hormones that the adrenal glands produce. So they were discovered by these two uh, biochemists, one from uh, Basel in Switzerland and one uh, from the Mayo Clinic itself. Um, and, the, and overnight the mortality of uh, adrenalectomy, especially bilateral adrenalectomy, essentially reduced from 30% to uh, practically zero. And this discovery was so important to the advancement of uh, medical therapy that uh, these two individuals received a joint Nobel Prize in 1950. So what exactly are the adrenal glands and what do they do? I think we've heard quite a fair bit of this uh, from Dylan before, um, but here, here's a diagrammatic representation. So two little uh, five to six centimeter glands on top of each kidney. So we've got two of them, one on each side. And we know that it produces cortisol, but it also produces the whole host of other hormones that we, we won't really um, go into uh, today, but they include uh, aldosterone, um, uh, adrenaline, and the, what we call sex hormones. So just how common is adrenal surgery these days? So over the last 20 years, so this data I've um, obtained from the Monash University Endocrine Surgery Unit database, which has been collecting endocrine surgery data over the last 20 years. There are only about 400, it sounds like a lot, 450 adrenal operations, but if you do the maths, that's only a couple of dozen a year of adrenal surgery that occur in these large tertiary institutions. Um, and only 5%, so it's only a very small percentage of these patients undergo bilateral uh, adrenalectomy. So having both adrenal glands removed. And out of those, only a third had both adrenal glands removed uh, for Cushing's disease and the other two thirds for other reasons. So what are the treatment options for Cushing's disease? I won't belabor this point. I think we've heard all this before. Uh, Transphenoid surgery, which can be repeated, um, long-term drug treatment, radiation treatment, and finally, if all those treatments have been explored and uh, there's still inadequate management of Cushing's disease, then uh, removal of both adrenal glands is possible, uh, which would almost always mean long-term replacement therapy with cortisol. So this is a CT scan of um, the abdominal cavity. So R stands for the right-hand side. So that's the right-hand side and where the big um, organ, which is the liver is. And then this is the left-hand side and the spine is the back. So that this patient is lying flat on the CT scanner and you imagine you're looking up the body uh, from the feet up. 
So if I draw across here, across um, this slice of the CT scan, you can see that the adrenal glands are deep within our abdominal cavity. So it is really difficult to access um, for surgery. So back in the 1930s, open surgery was the only option. We need, if one adrenal gland needed to be operated on, we can access the adrenal gland through a, a cut under the rib cage. If both adrenal glands need to be accessed as in the case of Cushing's disease, then we extend that incision to the other side and that's known as the rooftop incision. Alternatively, a long midline incision can be used, but either way, um, it involves uh, very large incisions and, and and as a consequence, this was considered major surgery. Even if you make a big incision, it is still very deep to access those adrenal glands. In fact, we can't go, just go through all the organs that's within the body. We actually have to take the scenic route and avoid all these other organs, including, um, you don't have to worry about the details, but obviously that, that small bowel, large bowel, all the fat within it, pancreas, spleen, the kidney, and as well as the aorta. On the other side, there's also the central vein, which is the inferior vein, I cover the largest vein in the body, uh, the liver, and also the kidney, which is not on this slice of the CT scan. Fast forward a few decades, uh, in the 1990s, keyhole surgery become, be, uh, was becoming more common for any sort of surgery within the abdominal cavity, including the adrenal glands. So to operate on one side of the adrenal gland, we need to make three small holes with long instruments that can access the adrenal gland from under the rib cage up into the dome of the diaphragm. And uh, different incisions will need to be made for the other side of the adrenal gland. And in fact, when we do this surgery, we actually put the patient on this side so that we can use gravity to help uh, move the abdominal organs in the front of the adrenal gland um, to, um, for them to, be, get, to get out of the way for the surgery. So we use long instruments um, and we look at the screen uh, for our operation. And, and we, one of the things we put in there is a camera. So once we complete surgery on the one side, if the other adrenal gland also needs to be removed, we then have to turn the patient around and um, then repeat the whole process again with three new incisions. So some clever surgeons in the um, late 90s, early 2000s thought, what if we approach the adrenal glands with these, this new technology of the camera, the keyhole surgery and the long instruments from the back? So essentially turning the patient upside down and approaching um, the adrenal glands from the back. And as you, you can see, all those organs in front of the adrenal gland are no longer in the way. We don't need to move them out of the way. Um, and there's quite a relatively direct route to the adrenal gland. So that has now become what is known as the keyhole surgery from the back or the retroperitoneal um, approach. So in this diagram here, um, the uh, yellow triangle represents the, uh, the location of the adrenal gland inside the body and the three red lines are three sort of um, one to two centimeter incisions on each side again with long instruments um, we're able to access adrenal gland from there so that over the last 10 to 15 years has become really the gold standard of adrenal surgery especially especially for adrenal glands that are less than six centimeters in size or tumors that are less than six centimeters in size so what are the benefits of this approach other than the fact that it is more direct um, to uh, access the adrenal gland. In fact, there are quite a few benefits that have been shown. Um, the smaller incisions uh, allows for faster recovery of the patient and therefore shorter stay in the hospital and less pain. Shorter surgery time also um, uh, confers benefits to less complications such as wind infections um, and, and deep vein thrombosis, uh, which are all um, uh, issues uh, with surgery in patients with Cushing syndrome. And one of the other benefits is that, as we saw before, if we approach the um, adrenal gland from the front through the uh, anterior keyhole surgery, we need to basically do the operation twice by and, and moving the patient in between. Whereas with a posterior approach, with a um, approach from the back, 
we can, in fact, if we have two teams of surgeons and surgical staff, we can do the two operations simultaneously and further reducing the operative time, again, reducing the risk of any uh, complications or problems arising with long operative time. So just before I finish up, I would just like to uh, show you a short video of what it actually looks like from um, within the, uh, 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 during the surgery. So just if um, this is not um, the type of thing for you, please just um, bear with me for a couple of minutes. I won't show you the whole video. I will, um, uh, if I can play it, I will just um, go to a certain time points there. So as we um, enter the retroperitoneal uh, space, it is not a natural cavity. So it doesn't just um, open up um, like the anterior abdominal cavity. So we actually have to cut away all these um, fat and tissue around. So the red thing you can see, or the pink thing you can see down the bottom of the screen now is the kidney. So we then have to move all the tissue away from the kidney. And, um, and as we progress, we will um, in a couple of minutes come, in, um, come to view of the adrenal gland. So, the, so that golden looking um, organ, small organ here, that is the adrenal gland. That's what um, adrenal gland looks like. And we often describe it as a golden color. And further in uh, through the dissection, uh, you will see uh, now the inferior vena cava is coming into view. So it's very important that uh, the adrenal gland is carefully lifted off uh, this uh, great vessel. I'll just fast forward uh, into a, in a couple of minutes, you will see that the, um, the adrenal vein, uh, it should be around here, sorry. The adrenal vein is now uh, being dissected. Uh, let me find the right spot. Apologies for that. Yep. So the adrenal vein is being dissected here. So this is the main vessel that needs to be secured uh, during adrenal surgery. And once the adrenal vein is secured, whoops, um, here using the the ligature device, which both seals the vessel and also cuts it when it's just, it's just cut it now, um, then the rest of the adrenal gland can be um, dissected off the uh, other attachments. You can see small vessels coming in from the top there um, and di dissecting it off the, the back of the diaphragm, the back of the kidney, um, and away from the rest of the um, cavity there. I'm gonna stop there for now. So yeah, I think that's uh, all I wanted to talk about adrenal surgery today. I know it's very brief, um, but I'm trying to leave a bit more time for questions. And, um, and I, the, the key points I wanted to come, take home today is that for anyone who needs adrenal surgery, whether it is for Cushing's disease, but especially for Cushing's disease, um, it is very much a team approach. And bilateral adrenalectomy um, is really the last resort. Um, and there are many other treatment options and, and the surgical technique for adrenal surgery has really come a long way over the last um, 100 years or so. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you very much, um, James. And uh, thank you to all our speakers for uh, sharing their thoughts with us today. Uh, if the speakers can all come back online in terms of their cameras, we do have a few uh, questions that we're gonna go through. And again, if you've got any questions, please feel free to put them into the actual chat on the side there. Um, the first question actually is for Jack. Uh, are you back online there, Jack? Um, I'm not certain. Yes, hey, Gallic. Yes, you get. Yeah, you're, you're, you're out, on the, out on the farm. The, uh, oh, yep. So the, um, I think they've, um, I mean, I think that Dylan and then uh, Cecilia talked about the impact of how radiation may have on the influence of hormones. And the first question is, at this stage, you're 11 months post radio surgery. You're probably two and a bit years after a couple of uh, transnasal uh, microsurgeries or endoscopic surgeries. Um, and you had said that you had uh, low testosterone previously. Have you had any other issues with your hormones thus far? The rest of the other hormones? Uh, no, I, I, I've been very lucky actually since my second surgery, uh, my testosterone came back um, higher. And then since the radiation, Everything else seems to be uh, normal. Thyroid, um, testosterone, all well, well above the, the low levels. So I'm very happy that, that nothing has been impacted as of yet. 
Okay. And, and Dylan, how often do we test for the hormonal changes uh, after radio surgery in this situation? Yeah, uh, we, we certainly don't um, uh, develop hormonal deficiency, uh, hormonal deficiencies uh, rapidly. So it doesn't, it's not something that we worry about, uh, you know, to test every month or something like that. Um, typical follow-ups would be every six months, um, we would do uh, um, in the initial sort of phase after radio surgery. And uh, we will, we will actually make the follow up less frequent as we go along without deficiencies. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Uh, another question for you, um, Dylan, is yeah. that with Tyroprone, you said it's one of the medical managements nowadays that can be used uh, in some instances for Cushing's disease. Yeah. Um, do you know what the cost of it? Is it actually subsidized on PBS or, or is it very expensive at the moment? Uh, it is very expensive. Um, the the uh, it isn't PBS subsidized. Having said that, um, uh, we have um, at St Vincent's at least um, a process of which we can apply um, to uh, um, access what's called compassionate access through the hospital. Of course, priority for that is given to um, you know, life-threatening inpatient conditions. Um, and hence we have to make a really good strong case as to why we would end up on medical therapy. And often the questions that get asked from the committee as to why we're not pursuing other more definitive management. So it really is um, uh, our only option of getting some sort of subsidy. Uh, the cost is something, uh, it will depend on the dosage. So for example, it comes in 250 milligram capsules and. Um, uh, a, a, a bottle of 50 will cost something in the order of about $420. So that is very costly because, um, you know, if you look at a month's supply of the lowest possible dose, which is about 250 milligrams twice daily, uh, you're looking at, you know, uh, at the lowest dose, something in the order of $420 for 25 days. Uh, but the dosage can go up to three times that, which would make the cost more than $1,000 a month then. Okay. Okay. Um... Another question with regards to medical therapy, Dylan, why, why don't we just use medication therapy long-term? I mean, why do we want to look at surgery or radio surgery for xenolectomies? Yeah, no, good question. Um, and it all just comes down to the rate of success in, in achieving uh, remission and hence other subsequent complications of having untreated pathologically high levels of uh, cortisol that can bring on other mainly metabolic complications such as obesity, diabetes, uh, hypertension, uh, and, and um, osteoporosis. So medical therapy will not achieve remission uh, at a rate at which the other modalities can. Uh, medical therapy is not without its own problems. Uh, for example, ketoconazole, one of the things, a more affordable drug than metarapone, uh, there's a big worry about liver uh, damage. Um, especially when used in the longer term. And we certainly don't have very good long-term data on, on using these drugs for decades, you know, and um, that will always be a concern of ours, especially when we're not achieving the sort of outcomes that we need to as well. Okay, all right. Um, Cecilia, a question uh, regarding radio surgery. Um, we have uh, uh, James Lee talking about adrenalectomies and you, you know, we've moved from endoscopic surgery to uh, with radio surgery for pituitary gland. Is there any role for radio surgery to the adrenals uh, as opposed to adrenalectomies? That's a really good question, actually. So I'll have to preface this by saying that in terms of focused radiation, I'm a brain specialist, but I have colleagues who do the same sort of focused radiation outside the brain, and that's called stereotactic body radiotherapy or stereotactic body radiosurgery. Um, we have done a number of cases of using this focused radiation to the adrenal gland. So initially that was in adrenal metastases from other cancers, uh, but there is some emerging data on using bilateral adrenal stereotactic body radiotherapy for that very situation, not to steal James's thunder. And as I said, it's not, it's not my specific area of specialty, but I think that may be something that we see more of over the coming sort of decade. And I also just wanted to point out, I'm very jealous of Jack's clear skies at the moment up here in Sydney. All I've got outside my door is rain. <laughs> yes. All right. Thank you for that. Um, question for James here. 
the uh, do we all do we always do bilateral adrenalectomies uh, in this situation? Is there any benefit in doing one adrenal gland only? Yeah, now that's a really good question. So for for Cushing's disease, so by definition, the reason for the Cushing syndrome in Cushing's disease is an external stimulus to the to the adrenal gland, and both adrenal glands are usually um, equally stimulated. So almost always, uh, because there's never, you never say never in medicine, but almost always um, to be effective, you do need to do bilateral adrenalectomy. But the, um, the unilateral, uh, so one-sided adrenal surgery um, are reserved for those patients who have problems with one adrenal gland. So you can have a tumor within the adrenal gland itself producing cortisol uh, that's got nothing to do with the pituitary and the other one is completely normal. So in that, and that's the more common um, in terms of adrenal surgery, that's the more common reason for adrenal surgery for Cushing syndrome. And in those situations, you do just take out the one gland. And in fact, um, it's, it's the, the post-operative course is quite different because you don't need replacement therapy. You usually don't need replacement therapy long-term. You might need it short-term, but you don't need it long-term after removal of just one gland due to tumor. Okay. And that leads on to the second question, which may in include both Dylan and James. Uh, what daily medication is required if you've had bilateral genolectomies? Um, does the cortisol go disappear straight away? Uh, are we replacing this? And maybe, uh, I don't know who wants to go first, maybe Dylan. Yeah, well, I mean, we, we would have to start um, hydrocortisone replacement and flu fluidrocortisone being the other one. Um, and I think that's what James was talking about, uh, saying that there are other hormonal functions of the uh, adrenal gland um, and they will, uh, they will have to be replaced uh, almost straight away. And uh, the dosages are adjusted based off uh, both clinical criteria as well as biochemical criteria in order to adjust that for a, a given individual. And that's daily administration of tablets, essentially. Okay. Uh, thank, yeah, that's exactly right, Dylan. So I, I would just like to ask, so in terms of um, care in that immediate period after the surgery, so I, I alluded to the fact that doing surgery on one adrenal gland versus two adrenal glands is very different. So if, in someone who has one adrenal gland removed with a normal adrenal gland on the other side, the other side with the current um, technique of the keyhole surgery from the back it's virtually an overnight sometimes even possible for a day procedure so it's a very short hospital stay whereas if we have if we remove both adrenal glands at the same time you the um uh, the post-operative care is a lot more complex, definitely a, a multi-team approach, multidisciplinary team approach. And Dylan uh, also mentioned in the, um, his talk that the cortisol level is adjusted due to your stress levels. Having surgery is huge stress. So, um, so that, that stress dose of additional cortisol needs to be given as soon as both glands are removed. And we need to watch that for a few days before we can let the patient go home. And also the other thing to remember is that being the last resort for Cushing's disease, these patients have been affected by high levels of cortisol for a long time. So by the time they come to surgery, their body's already quite tired. They're not very good at fighting off infection. Wound healing might be a little bit poorer than usual with the diabetes as well. Um, and then there's high risk of both bleeding and blood clots. So the, the, the care for these patients becomes quite complex and sometimes even challenging in that situation. Uh, a few more questions that we'll try and get through relatively quickly. Uh, Cecilia, long-term um, uh, risk of cancers with radiation, radio surgery uh, to the skull base, the doses you're using, please. Sure, look, I mean, that's something that I always talk to patients about. I've never had a patient have a cancer after stereotactic radio surgery. And look, partly that's because the volume that we're treating is really, really small. Uh, but having said that, the quote that I usually use is less than 0.1%. Uh, and it's something that can happen 10 to 20 years or more down the track. Okay, perfect. Thank you. A uh, question for Dylan. Uh, any comments on the use of uh, Dostonex or for second-line treatment uh, for control of Cushing's? Uh, has it been effective? Is there any, any dose uh, in an effect? Does the effect reduce over time? Uh, um, so, yes, there's definitely a place for Dostonex. It's often something that we go to um, if we've exhausted adrenal-based therapy, uh, partly because um, the, if you look at the studies looking at um, 
the improvement in urinary free cortisol, there's better evidence for adrenal-based therapy. However, um, sometimes when we're limited with side effects, especially, um, we will progress to using Docinex. If there's residual tumor present on MRI that can't be accessed surgically, uh, they're the ones that might probably uh, likely benefit um, more by the use of pituitary-based therapy. Um, but Yes, the, in, 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 there aren't big studies that have been done, but we do certainly see the effect wear off over time. So that is a problem. Okay. Um, question that has come through regarding, uh, can someone explain Nelson syndrome associated with an adrenalectomy? Uh, and maybe I'll go to Dylan again with that one, please. Yeah, well, um, yeah, Nelson. We have... We have five minutes, this can be go for a long time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. so it, it, Nelson's is essentially a, a clinical and radiological diagnosis occurring after commonly bilateral uh, adrenal surgery for Cushing's. Essentially, ACTH levels tend to rise. Um, and the thought is that there isn't enough feedback, although, although steroids are given uh, externally after adrenalectomy, there isn't enough inhibition that occurs on the ACTH uh, and and at, a, at a micro level, there's growth of uh, either the pre-existing tumor to a macroscopic level, um, and, and that there can be disinhibited growth that occurs. Um, uh, it's not something that's essentially uh, th that will um, give many issues if it's a small area, but uh, the rising ACTH can cause hyperpigmentation. If the tumor gets big enough, the tumor itself will cause cranial nerve palsies, all the issues that can be associated with an enlarging pituitary tumor, essentially, headaches, visual symptoms, and, and the like. Um, radiotherapy uh, seems to have a protective effect in some studies, not all. Um, and uh, so having, having had radiotherapy before, an adrenalectomy uh, in some studies was shown to reduce the, the occurrence of this. Anyone who had higher uh, sort of ACTH levels uh, following surgery was at more risk and people who had more severe and rapid onset pushings were at more risk. But the actual dosage of at which you give the steroids or return the hydrocortisone doesn't seem to have any association with this. I might ask Cecilia if she's got any comments in it about the radiotherapy and Nelson's. Thanks for that. Look, um, also, I guess, just to point out as a treatment for Nelson. So I've actually treated a number of patients with stereotactic radiosurgery who've developed Nelson's, who may not have had radiation as part of their initial treatment. So I guess just remembering that, you know, radiotherapy can have a role in that sort of situation as well. Okay, great. Um, the, there's another, there's a question from Sylvia Tetlow, who Sylvia is one of our patient support liaison coordinators. She, she does volunteer with the foundation. Uh, as well uh, for Cushing disease. Uh, is there a plan to have a Cushing disease registry in Australia? Um, now, I, I'm gonna to go to you again, Dylan, then I might have a comment on this as well. I was hoping you could answer that. Um... Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I guess I, I will take this. Uh, Sylvia, the answer is there's always, re disease registries are, are very important and do have great benefit. Uh, particularly with something like Cushing's where we, I think we've seen today with all our speakers and Jack's journey that it's complex, okay? If it's really easy, when you've got appendicitis, you take it out, that's the end of the story, that's the treatment to, to be done, okay? If you've got, uh, you know, uh, with your Cushing's, we've got to diagnose it correctly, which can take a long time. We have to choose the correct treatment and the correct treatment is a treatment algorithm where it starts with diagnosis, usually surgery, transnasal surgery, then maybe medical therapy whilst you're looking at radiosurgery. And then we may look at adrenalectomies. And after adrenalectomy, we heard we might actually be using radiosurgery again okay, uh, for Nelson's. And because each of these steps, the actual success rate is not 100%, it's a very complex thing. And that's where I think a disease registry is a good option. Okay? However, we need a certain entry point and common point of diagnosis. And the problem with a Cushing's registry is that the diagnosis sometimes can be difficult, right? So apart, so without having a disease registry, what the foundation is trying to do and, the, and trying to push through is these pituitary centers of excellence, which tries to have the, um, the highest uh, level of uh, multimodality care, whereby we can actually get the diagnosis as robust as possible with the most uh, effective uh, combination of screening tests. Uh, and that's where we are starting with 
a disease registry then can come from that if we have multiple pituitary centers of excellence treated in a few large centers. And there's very good evidence that, uh, that if we can actually treat someone in high volume pituitary centers, the actual outcomes are better. And you can see most of these, all of our speakers and, and Jack are treated at high volume centers, which then gives them a great expertise in that region there. Okay. I hope that answers your question slightly, Sylvia. It may not fully, but um, that's where we're kind of headed for this. And certainly the foundation is trying to push for more of these centers of excellence throughout the actual nation. On that note, we've hit 2, 202. Uh, I want to thank again all our speakers. Thank you, uh, specifically Jack, to take time out of your day, your sunny day in the farm there. I can see you're still working. I'm really pleased that you are able to work like this um, with everything that's been going on. Uh, to Dylan, Cecilia and James, thank you very much for your time and expertise and to all our uh, audience who have been listening in. Uh, this uh, webinar has been recorded be collated and then I'll actually put it through on our website our, uh, and our YouTube channel on our website also which is pituitary.asn.au uh, we do have multiple information sheets so if you are looking at some uh, we have a Cushing disease information sheet that's on there in conjunct which talks about these in a very sort of two page uh, handout actually this is three pages uh, but a lot of these are on there in terms of acromegaly as well other treatments and uh, things like that so uh, thank you very much for attending uh, we will obviously let you know when we're having our next one and we will see you all uh, next time. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Bye.